afternoon and welcome we're so excited there's so many people are here this is really exciting <laughs> this is real <laughs> it's real it's real <laughs> um so welcome everyone um my name is uh, dr rifile lipere and welcome to the first ever <laughs> T.U.T. Writers Lab New Works Reading Festival. Boom, boom, really boom, boom. <laughs> really awesome. Go. It's really awesome. So um, if you seeing like everyone, it's just everybody's yeah. It's really exciting. <laughs> everybody's yeah. Okay. Um, so how are we going to run today? It's very simple. Um, I will, we will post the program. It's not going to be much of a long program, but we just wanted to welcome you. It's really exciting. I suddenly forgot my lines because I'm so excited. <laughs> so <laughs> all of the stuff that I planned to say, boom, out of, the, <laughs> out of my head, we forgot. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for making time. Thank you for showing up for us and for showing up for each other. So before we go further, we just wanted to let you know where you are so that you are aware of what's going on. So you are part of the New Works Reading Festival 2021. It's the first uh, ever, We've tried, we're trying it out today, for the first time. And um, we'd like you to participate, to be part of it, and to really bring your whole self, especially when it's really hard, when we're not together, to try and be present, right? But we're asking that everyone, as much as possible, if you can come and show up and be present with us, we'd really appreciate that. Um, and then the other thing, I think the other, if there is a, a rule, is that we would like you to just participate. I don't know, I don't know if you have any other rule. I think there is a space where you can raise your hands, 
Um, so if you want to speak, just raise your hand so that we acknowledge you. If you have comments, please type it up in the comment section. If something is moving you, the emojis, please use the emojis and, um, um, you know, you know, respond with your emojis. Um, if uh, there is anything else, yeah, let us know. Um, so the first thing I would like us to do as we starting to, to, to be with each other, I'm a very, I believe in, in really opening spaces and allowing everybody to be, bring their whole selves into the space. So I want you to take a moment. We're all going through a lot. So I'm not gonna ignore that we are in the middle of a pandemic. We are all locked up in our little homes. And um, so I'm not gonna ignore that. So I'm gonna take a time and ask you all to take a moment to be present and acknowledge everyone that is here. We would have, if we were, <laughs> students know if we were close to each other, I would say, look around the room, give everyone a nice good look. But if you're not, you're not able, but just look around, see who's around, who's present, who's here. And just notice that you also arrived and you also came. So just take a moment for that, for you to arrive and come and be with us. Um, and then the second thing I'd like to do is um, a number of us, um, I know personally, I have lost uh, family members and friends and um, various people. So in light of that and in, uh, in acknowledging them um, and also acknowledging our own work around theater work and creative work and people losing jobs. I'd like us to take a moment to acknowledge that, but more importantly, we lost a dear colleague, friend, a father, figure, a mentor, someone who got a lot of us excited about the work we do and the things we do. So I wanted us to take a moment to really honor Prof. Kennedy Chinoa um he died a couple of weeks ago and it's been a very hard time to be present and to show up so i want us to take a moment of silence um to acknowledge and um be present with prof chinoa and we i'd like to dedicate this um reading to him and if you can also take a moment to dedicate this time that we're together to anybody you want your family member your loved ones or anybody else who you know is um, not able to be here maybe um, because some things is happening at home, they're being present today, they can't be present with us here. So whatever you need for that moment. So I'd like us to take this moment to really dedicate this time to Prof. Kennedy Chinua. So just a moment of silence for Prof.
present and show, showing up for us and being with us. Okay, so thank you so much for that and uh, for acknowledging with me and together. And I hope you all find uh, moments of uh, reprieve and we can find moments where we can grieve uh, properly for the ones we've lost. Um, it has not been easy. It's been really difficult. But to continue with the rest of our program, um, I would like Mr. Huli Sanindo to speak a little bit about he's my co-teacher around script writing. So we teach different years and I'd like him to just have a quick word. If he can, the last time we tried, his um, mic was not working, but if he can, Huli, please just say a bit about where, we, what are we thinking about the script writing course and how we're shifting and changing it in different ways. Thank you, Huli Sanindo. We can't hear you. No. It ain't gonna work. Okay. No, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> All right. No, it's fine. Okay. Will you will write it? We'll type it up for us. Um in our chat box. Um, our next, uh, in terms of just also to conceptualize what we're doing and how we're thinking about this festival. Um, yeah, we've said that, that you should remove the earphones. But <laughs> we also said that, but. <laughs> All right. Can you, um, can you hear me now? Then to move on to the Writers Lab uh, to speak a bit about yeah. this concept that we've been trying out with the Writers Lab around the Writers Lab. And really, the thing that we're doing is not something that's unique to us. I think we are pulling it from the Writers Lab and what, they, what they've been doing. So, someone from the Writers Lab um, can lead us into that conversation. Um. Okay, I guess I'll talk since Eddie's going to keep quiet. Um, oh, wait. <laughs> um, I can't hear anyone. Wait, wait. You can't hear us? Can you hear us now? Speak again, Katlaro. Can you hear us now? Yes, yes, yes. Now. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Lepere, uh, Dr. Ndu. Um, so yeah, just a, a little bit about the Writers Lab. So we, I'm prophesying, Dr. Ndo. Um, we, we started um, our work at the end of 2017 and really the lifeblood of the organization has been creating moments like these where the community can come together to assist young writers to develop their work um, by offering a space of critique and reflection of feedback. You know, it's never easy um, in those sessions, you know, because you're dealing with the darlings, you know, that have taken uh, a lot of time to come into fruition, but we, we try to move with utmost care um, in order to develop the works into something that will one day see the stage. Um, so I, I, I'm grateful to Dr. Lepera for conceptualizing this festival and like to just see everyone who's here, you know, that's just like uh, an extension of that philosophy of community and like holding space for, for each other. Um, thank you also to all of the writers who have made their works available. You know, that, that action of opening up your heart in this way is it can be a very daunting one and so you know this space is supposed to be a safe one where we can come together and you know build the work um just to end off uh last year this year at our launch of hauntings we have a book by the way guys we have a book just let me just stop my video this is the book called hauntings right dr Lepere is one of our, our authors in the book um and at the launch um eddie Eddie once, Eddie said that, you know, one of our greatest missions as the Writers Lab is to create spaces like these where there's constant development of, of new work. You know, it's it's all good and well to create space for professional writers to do their thing, but, you know, we are interested in this developmental space. And so we're grateful to, to TUT, to the Department of Performing Arts and to this course for creating this, this moment where we can come together and, and just be community. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And it's such a great um, thing that uh, Writers Lab started. So I, we, the Writers Lab started a while back and I jumped in and, and it's a really great space for everyone to just try and find community and the space for 
uh, readers, a space for uh, writers, a space where you can be able to develop your own work. So I encourage all of my students who are here and anyone else who's here to um, uh, join the Writers Lab. They, they should be aware that we must do a membership <laughs> form. <laughs> we are gonna do an online one. We used to have like little forms, <laughs> but we are on Facebook, we are on Instagram. Uh, follow us, be with us, be part of the community, bring your play, um, and we're working on a new anthology. So yes, we are going to, <laughs> you know, we're working on a new anthology. So we're looking, we're um, expanding and trying to do more work. So please, 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 please come through um, and be part of us. Um, and then just a, a few, uh, I'm gonna ask my co-curator, Unasi Pinkumbesi, who organized this whole uh, festival with me um, around when we were thinking about, yes, let's do it. Why we're thinking why is important. So Nasi, we just took a minute, a minute just to say to everyone why we think, why as a student, you were like, yes, this should happen. Why must it happen here? And then we're going to move to the place. All right. Yes, Nasi P. Okay, cool. Uh, greetings to everyone and welcome to the New Works Festival. Writers Festival founded by Dr. Rafile Liberi. And so the aim of this festival is to afford writers an opportunity for them to experience their work. Um, we want them to see and learn about the difference between how a writer perceives their work on their own written versus how an actor, a director, other writers and audiences receive their work. So really the essence of the festival is to like give writers the opportunity to hear what their thoughts sound like, what their concepts and ideas and views of the world are. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nasibi. <laughs> thank you so much, you did so well. And you were like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> you were out here <laughs> being me, me. I'm gonna say why, no, look at you. All right, um, so yeah, so thank you everyone. So. We have, so how, we, how it's going to run, we will play, um, so we've got three plays and we have five monologues. So it's three plays and five monologues. Uh, the monologues are short, so we'll play the monologues, um, uh, five minutes of the monologues. And there's one monologue that's nine minutes, so we won't play the <laughs> we will have to play that whole nine minutes of that monologue. <laughs> but all the other monologues are much shorter. All right. Um, and then we have three plays, but with the plays, we'll only play uh, five minutes of the plays and then so that we have time to speak back to the pieces. But we will put the link to the YouTube playlist of all the plays where you can see all of them. They're on YouTube, they're on a playlist. So I'll put them, I'll put, I'll put that um, on the on the chat and you can go and look at everything and watch everything for yourself in your own timing. But for now, it is just to engage with the three plays and the five monologues. Um, and you will understand that the, we started, TT's year only started in, we started in April, but then we had, <laughs> you know, we had, <laughs> we had stuff going on. So we, <laughs> we started actually in May. And then when we started classes, we were on, then we went off to online and then online was, you know, now we're online. So it's been a very hard time for our students to really engage with the work and really, but they've really done well for a two month, two month, yeah, two months of engaging of really just a teaching year. So it's been an, a May, June experience. And so only, uh, and so this is what we've asked. So it's there, if all the pieces are at the beginning stages, they literally add the homework I've just sent them out to do and then bring back and write back, right? So please, um, as you are watching, remember this and remember that context. Um, okay, so the first piece that we're gonna watch is um, Gallows by Zintle Bobi. So this is the only piece that is different because Zintle is our MA student and she has recently uh, registered for her MA in script writing. So really excited. And um, I'm not sure if, no, it's not gonna be part of her MA write up, but it is, <laughs> it is an exciting part for me and her to go on this journey as we are creating together. So um, the, that's what it is. All right, so let me share. Let's see. <laughs> DJ is... <laughs>
cast of characters, Lusapo, a 46-year-old South African male imprisoned in a foreign country, Warden, a 53-year-old cold and stern man, Seen, a pollen solitary cell, Time, a day in 1997, Act 1, Scene 1, a solitary room with a single bed covered with a light gray sheet placed diagonally, a silver toilet bowl. There is a plain desk on with a pillow placed vertically on top. A small stool about 30 centimeters high is under a small window on the back wall about 10 centimeters in height and 15 centimeters in width. A man in his mid forties is holding a metal plate and spoon and banging it recklessly and uncontrollably. He chants along and stamps the ground, going in different states of frenzy. He stands in attention and then bangs the plate as if he is ringing a bell. He places the plate and spoon on the floor, then stands straight, singing with closed eyes and arms folded. Low, 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 in Pundi, so says we lacu, Uze Uzibu, Sele, Sibinian, so yacu. Amen. Good morning, teacher. We are fine, thanks, and you. Me too, I am fine. <laughs> Lenos, today is the last day of school. Hey, hey yes. We will go to class and sign the register. And when we are finished, we will eat our RDP and go home. Remember the rules are busy. So you need to be careful when crossing it. It is left, right. Then left again. Yes, teacher. Yes, teacher. We are marching. We are marching in the light of God. My love. <laughs> Son of Psalms, Nanda Mate. That was the best day of every one of us. Me, my brother, Caesar, and that slow banana. Hey, three of us. We sing a tukani. After we were done eating our big slice of brown bread and with that dry peanut butter and that sweet orange juice, we ran with our school books in the plastic bag, racing home. <laughs> hey, my love. La -la -la -la. Everything was a competition for us. Even who go to the gate first, banana will be the first, I'll be the second, and scissor was always the last because hey, became cold, man. Now we are more man. And we ran that day, rushing to change our school uniform and leave the house before Mama came from selling at the market and joking. We wanted to finish with the wire cards we were making for the tournament. My love, I told you about our tournament and Andesho. I told you, yeah, hey, hey, we were gonna show those boys from it that that you are not to mess with the boys from Kwasakeli. Honey, my stokul, you can't come races. Yes. Oh, let me continue the story, baby. So, okay, Emma, Emma, where was I? Oh, yes. We ran and ran, but we got to the text ring. Brass, which my uncle's friend called us. Ish, ish, ish. We knew better than to pretend we didn't hear him. So we went. He sent us some food to go on mom dear. Because he was hungry from talking the politics, man. I took the money and ran for Prastiv's lunch because I was the responsible one, my love. And plus, Banana was going to pinch it. It was on him. Why is Kelim or oh, Aibo always in trouble with his mama? But we could never have fun without him. So we rushed and came back quickly. Honey. He stops and looks at the pillow. Honey. Are you right? Are you listening? Okay, okay, okay. You sure I can go on? I know you have always asked me this story and, and I always told you it is not important, but today, today I'm telling you all of it, all of it, my love. I, 
I, Lusapo, want to share these things with you. Yes, I will take you. Oh, no. I will take out the rubbish now, baby. But I said I would. Okay, okay. I'll take it out now. I will do as you say, madam. I will do. He turns towards the toilet bowl, then turns to the pillow again, singing. Sanu teta ganga da, hizo nge ni mahamba. Sanu teta ganga da, hizo nge ni mahamba. Sisi hum, hum, hum. Sisi hum, hum, hum. Hey, hey, man. Did I ever teach you this song? Sanu teta ganga da, hizo 1984. Kanisa Senior Secondary School Choir. Hey. We went district, we went provincial, and even when I have the national level as my love, I was only 17, but my bass was like down there in that choir. Other boys even started smoking just so they could hear the vibrator. Come, let me teach you some of this song. It's nice. It is not so hard. You will say, Okay, it is too hard. Uh, my love. Okay, let me start with the rubbish. He moves to the toilet bowl and starts searching around it. He bends and looks from underneath it and goes back to the table where the pillow is, looking at it. Tell me the truth. You have already taken out the trash, right? You know I would forget. And you took it out. I am sorry, my love. Okay? I'm sorry you had to take it out yourself. I will make it up to you, okay? Do you forgive me? You forgive me, right? He goes and very closely to the pillow, flirting. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. All right. Um, we will pause it there. That is uh, about eight minutes. Um, so I would like, I forgot to introduce our panelists. Look at me. Um, please switch on your videos, comrades, so I can introduce you. Uh, Hello, Mr. Kelly. Hello, Mr. Kelly. Hello, Mr. Kelly. I need to move from one screen to the other so that it doesn't look weird. Yeah. Oh, there you are. And then, uh, but then I'm Eddie. Okay. I'm here. Yes, there's a new Eddie. All right. So please, um, these this is our panel. These are our, our, our guests. They're going to speak back. So, so just a few, a, a quick introduction to everybody, so that we, you know, who's here. So. Uh, I'm gonna read out there. Wait, one room city bio, so I must read it. You know, I must be that good girl. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, Eddie Taba, um, most students know him. Uh, he is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful teacher. I, I wish I was in Eddie Tara's class. Uh, every time I hear him speak, I'm like, why did I never <laughs> engage with this man? So Eddie is our drama lecturer and he's a writer for stage and screen with television credits in Ekasi, Our Stories, Rhythm City, Isi Dingo. And he's currently a writer and storyliner in the new SABC series drama, The Estate. He has a BTEC in drama from Tony University of Technology, and he also majored in script writing and directing. He graduate, he's also a graduate from the NAVF uh, Spark Script Editors course. And Eddie has a passion for learning and teaching, and he's currently on a break from teaching to focus on his MA in drama. Please let's welcome Mr. Eddie Taba. And next up, we have um, Miss Swongile. Oh, Swongile is a joy. How do I, <laughs> I, met how do I come after that? Like, I'm, like, my bio is two lines. Ah, my ah, bio is just like. <laughs> <laughs> so I met Swongile a couple of years ago as co-teachers. Um, and we were teaching at the Market Lab, uh, script writing. Um, uh, course that Umpile runs 
And oh my God, what a joy to be able to co-teach. And I really believe in part of what I got from there a lot and is the idea that we really need to collaborate a lot. We need mm. to do more collaborations. Um, and co-teaching is such a, a, a wonderful experience, especially with writing and having to have someone to read with you. So Swahile is an award-winning writer <laughs> based in South Africa. She teaches writing, short fiction, playwriting, poetry. She's passionate about accessibility to the arts and technology in marginalized communities. She holds a BCom in marketing from UJ and a national mm. higher certificate in performing arts from the Market Lab. She has publications in the Migrations, SSDA, Between the Pillar and the Post, uh, published by Diaz Kunacheng, Salves, Anthropol Anthologies, Pafrock Magazine, Mail and Guardian, Black Text, Burden or Ubuntu, Jonathan Ball Publishers, Joba Noir, Jakana, Lolwe, Years of Fire and Ash, South African Poems and Decolonization. So Swongile is a fire, fire, fire. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Like a bomb. Oh. Like, wow. Oh. Bomb. <laughs> Fire. Hot. And then next up with our hotness is our dear Mr. Charlie. Mr. Charlie. Mr. Charlie. Mr. Charlie is a dramaturg. That's how I now know him. I'm like, this is our dramaturg, South African dramaturg. <laughs> Mr. Charlie is a multi-skilled creative um, in South Africa from Pitori. He is affectionately known by his peers as Chale. He's an accomplished writer, actor, voice artist, lecturer, and a social entrepreneur. His unique perspective on performing arts has led to an inquiry about the epistemic responsibility of theater makers in South Africa. To this end, Chale is involved in multi in the multiple community-based initiative. He chairs the Writers Lab, an organization with a mandate to train and support South African writers, and he also assists with the production of their works. He has a podcast titled A Theater Maker in Mzansi and is dedicated to interviewing South African theater makers and is pursuing his PhD in public intellectualism at the University of Pretoria. Welcome, welcome. So we've got fire bomb 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 dish 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 dish. Dish. All right. All right. So first up, we're going to speak to, I'm going to add Zintle to speak so that we can speak to Zintle's piece. So we'll add Zintle to the, to the foray. And um, we're going to speak back to Zintle's piece. So perhaps maybe just as a start, Zintle, just give us context of when you wrote the piece, what was the thoughts? Quickly. Hi. Hi, everyone. I almost said I don't remember. But um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, it was uh, so 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 when I wrote the piece, I think I wrote the piece in 2017. I was still in Durban at the time, but I had to rework it. Um, so it's just uh, about this man who's looking for uh, mercy, who's who's searching for mercy, but he's been isolated for so long, and he's obviously mentally derailed because of the isolation and everything that he's been through in his life, and. Um, basically, he just didn't mean no harm, but it just so happened because of the things that happened to him that he did a lot of harm. And now he's uh, awaiting his uh, execution. He's about to be killed in a prison somewhere around the world um, by being hung. So, but he's not he's not perceiving his reality, and so he's deciding to tell everything to his wife that he because he was a quiet man. So he's deciding to you know how women are always like, what are you thinking? And then you're like nothing. So he's deciding now to tell her everything, but the wife is a pillow. She's not there. No one is there. He's crazy. Anyway, that's what's going on. Um, Everyone speak all at once and... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So is the process okay. are we like are we giving feedback now or I thought that would work. Or do we want to watch all of the pieces and then give feedback? No, no, is no. That I'm fine? happy to I'm happy to go ahead and give feedback. Um so I can can touch on Zinkle if that's fine. Okay. Or uh, the other colleagues, what do you think? What do you that's guys fine. think? Let's is go, that... yeah, let's, let's do it like this. Okay, let's sure. do it quickly. All right. Okay, cool. So 
Um, is it okay if I go first, Kakeho, Eddie? Is that cool? Cool. Cool. Thank you. All right, cool. So I, I actually, I went a little bit overboard with the feedback, guys. Um, but yeah, if you know me, it's just how, how I, I tend to be when it comes to writing. Um, so um, Zinke, overall, I think you have a very beautiful story, a very enthralling story that has the potential to become something very great. It's very topical. It speaks to the time with things around gender-based violence, um, mental health issues, illnesses, those kind of things. So I think there are very strong themes there. Um, I'm not gonna focus on the good, I think, cause you wanna build yourself. So I'll focus on some of the things that I saw, I, but overall, I think it is a strong story and it has the potential um, for you to just lift it and, and, and make it what it's meant to be. So I'll just start with the title. Um, I wrote here, can you hear me clearly? I might have to click this mic, okay, cool. Um, I wrote here that um, the title presumes that death um, is a primary theme for your play. Um, however, the word gallows um, and your character being executed conflicts with your chosen country. So um, Poland is actually one of the um, like early countries to abolish. Um, Sorry, now you sound a bit muffled. You sounded good My before, but now you sound a bit muffled. How's that? Is that fine? Is that good? Okay, I was saying your your chosen title um, conflicts with your your and your character and choosing your character to be executed um, conflicts with your your place. So where you're setting it conflicts with the country of choice. So maybe potentially look at another at another country because Poland we know is former communist nation, um, one of the first ones to actually abolish. Um, or death sentences and executions and stuff here yeah, so potentially maybe just relook look at that because it does make your through line a little bit implausible um uh yeah if i mean you really will find someone like me in the audience but if you do <laughs> they'll be like no 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 that place and and that that actually yeah it doesn't work um and then in terms of so maybe potentially look at another setting um, in terms of country of choice. Um, and then also, I think um, it's also the timing. So if you you still wanna set it in Poland, then maybe look at the timing that it's not 1997. So potentially earlier on in the early years, um, yeah, when, it, when they still, when they could, when they still executed people. So potentially then either change the timing or the actual setting. Um, and yeah, and then I wrote setting a play in a confined space like a prison cell means that you need to heighten the stakes to drive um, the narrative forward. Um, and I couldn't quite get the stakes in the in the in the in the piece. I, I couldn't I like I didn't get that sense of what is this man trying to not lose like if he lost it, what did it mean for him? So I couldn't really be that invested in him as a character. Um, and then, yeah, I might go on. It's, um, I'll send the feedback to, to Dr. Rafila and then she'll, she'll share it, but I'll just touch on the few main things um, that I call out. Um, and then I said, yeah, what does your protagonist want? What do they need? Um, and then I said, because he is a political um, character, maybe you need to consider the political relationship between um, the country of birth, which is South Africa, and the country of impres imprisonment, Poland, um, ANC being a former communist um, party or a party that held communist ideals and Poland being um, a communist um, country or a former communist country as well. So maybe that's something to look at there. And then in terms of your character, I said, your character suffers from a mental illness, but it is unclear which one because there is quite, it's extensive. There's a lot of different ones. And one of the reasons why I said it's, it's unclear is that um, it makes it harder for you if you're not clear in terms of he's crazy, what he's crazy is. It makes it harder for you as a writer to guide the choices he makes in the in the play. Um, so then, yeah, and then I just touch on how your play relies on this clarity. Um, so you need to choose what kind of mental illness he suffers from. Um, this will help you raise the stakes and it will create um, plausibility when you reveal the murder later on in the in the play. And then in terms of the story, I did, uh, as I've touched that it is a very topical story um, that has the potential to be enthralling. Um, I think you just need to mine it more, like spend more time with it. Um, it is a beautiful story, um, but 
it's at the moment it's playing to the tropes as in you writing to what theater is and what theater and what we know theater to be but if you spend more time with the actual story you're going to find those gems that I could pick up are there they just need you to um, spend more time with it um and then yeah um okay I'll that I can skip over. And then I said, why did he kill his wife for leaving him um, when he doesn't seem to have abandonment issues? So that's just one of the things in terms of the character. So you can create that so that when you reveal the fact that um, he chose to kill for her leaving, um, it makes sense that throughout, it's not necessarily death that he's been struggling with, but more abandonment. And when this struck, it triggered him um, in the way that he did. Um, and then, yeah, and then I just said, be careful of playing into the tropes, which is just when we write black characters, um, there's certain stereotypes we tend to play to. Um, and then I just have a few questions. One of them is look at your transitioning at certain points, the songs don't seem like they're not a natural transition for his kind of emotional state. So find moments where the song works for transition. And then in other moments, it could be things like, because he plays a lot in, in terms of memory, it could be things like hearing those um, banging of um, gunshots in Angola that actually send him into another state and triggers another memory. It could be various things. So it doesn't just necessarily always have to be, oh, he sings a song and then he transitions into something else. I'm trying to go as fast as I can. I will share this because it's quite, <laughs> I think it's, quite it's a fine. lot. <laughs> I think it's okay. Uh, well, it's fine. We have other, other people. <laughs> but I think what I want to highlight for everyone yeah, um, yeah. It, it's it's really awesome feedback because part of it is the things that are really key around research. And I think anyone who's heard me in classes or whatever, it's about research, research, research. And um, and these are the big things that you're highlighting. And also that um, to not take it for granted that our, you know, you know, black people, or you know, these people. So therefore you can, you know, um, represent or show them the way you know them. So I think that's great. Um, Eddie, can I give you then the next ones? Maybe we go to the next one and then you can then uh, speak back to those ones. All right. So okay. uh, thank um, you so much, Wingile. Thank I'll, you, Zizia. I guess I'll just send also written uh, notes to everybody because I watched everything. So next, next we'll just speak for to keep it short, but then we'll send all the notes to all the plays. Awesome, awesome. I think it's the challenges of um, data and the challenges of, <laughs> of not yeah. having each other in the same room that we can say, you know what, we've got coffee, stay. We've got biscuits, stay. <laughs> Let's do this. Who can still stay, all right? <laughs> so, um, but yeah. So, and the next one um, that we have, I've put the link on to the next one also. It's called Iskalegi Sasomzi by Sinovuyo. Um, so we will go to... Yeah. Keep your elders waiting. I was in the kitchen. Oh, <laughs> I'm a Diawana man. Eh? You are just cooking for your older brother. I can see that you love your brother so much. Ozala, come give your brother. Internet. <laughs> Little kiss, man. What's a lana? Putana grabs Deborah as to give her. Her an affectionate kiss. Hi, Putana wants Antoni. Please leave me alone. Deborah manages to get off Butana and heads for the door. I can see that you are taking advantage of the fact that Uta Domini and Umakaz are not here. Coming into the house drunk, this. Exit Deborah to the kitchen. Butana manages to find a seat. Re-enter Deborah with a plate of food. She places it on top of the table. In, take, take your food and go to sleep so you can 
sleep the drunkenness off. As she turns to walk away, Budana grabs her and places her on a table face down. Putana wins and Tony. Ah, Tula man. Tula. Shut up. So you're grown now, eh? I mean, I'll show you what I do to little girls who think that they are grown, eh? What's that, Lana? Putana then takes off Deborah's clothes and begins to assault her. She is screaming and asking for him, so for him to stop, but he doesn't listen. Gogo Mamiya is sleeping on her bed in her one room shack when she hears a knock at the door. Ngana, the door is open. Molo mama, ikamalam dinguzi kona. The seventh are AKTC Kukuletu Health Center. Jinkunes Paya. Oh no, it's okay, Mama. It's okay. <coughs> Sister Zikona quickly grabs some water to help Goko drink. Oh, and go Simtana. Thank you for visiting me. I hardly get visitors. We are born. I've been sick for quite some time now. I can tell that I'm getting closer and closer to my grief. Hi, hi, Mama Suta Sanjalo, don't say that. It is true, Adnan. Oh, I have let go of myself. A long, long time ago. But Nina Lucha, you can do better. Learn from our mistakes. <coughs> I am calling and I'm talking too much. It's just that. All right. Uh, yeah, young Shaba, technology. All right. Um, we're back. So, um, this was written by Snovuyo. Snovuyo, are you around? Yeah, I am here. All right. So, Snovuyo doesn't have a video. Oh, there she is. There, oh, videos I are. am here. <laughs> no, your videos are now. Hi. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, <laughs> all right. So, Snovuyo is part of our advanced diploma and advanced diploma is our fourth year. And so normally, and uh, yeah, it's our fourth year and it's our second level of script writing. So script writing happens at third year and at fourth year in our old curriculum. In the new curriculum, it does happen from second year. But in the old curriculum, it started at third year and then it goes to fourth year. So Snobuyo, just tell us a bit about, short, one minute, what, were your, what was your aim with this play? play? One minute, yo, that is too short, but I'll try. Um, uh, my aim when I started writing this play or when I thought about it was I wanted to write a play that has three lead female characters. And at first it was supposed to be a three-hander and these ladies were going to shift into their characters. But then I just, I, I, I just scratched out that idea. And it was inspired by my grandmother who lived in the Eastern Cape, when someone leaves uh, the homestead and goes to big cities. So yeah, it was inspired by her and her story. So him. Oh no, it's other like, but they are related. So she's Alex is also me. But uh, what happens is that uh, even though they don't know each other, they share the same curse. So they go through the same situations. It's like a repetition of uh, a curse. Hence, uh, the, the title is Kaleki Sosom. So that was what inspired um, this play. I hope I got everything. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, colleagues, anyone want to take it up? Okay, uh, Snowvio, yeah, from, from what you are saying, I find, I get the intentions be behind the story. So, but also you're speaking about a very topical issue, a very contentious issue, and a, an emotive issue. So the worst thing that you can do to, to such a, a topic is to not tell it well. Uh, so currently, I find myself asking, which story are you telling? So from what you are explaining now is when you're talking about people who meet each other and then find that they're actually related. So in the story, you've got these three women, they are related and, and what, what relates them is the curse that they have, which is uh, rape or sexual assault, as you put it in the, in the story. And it has uh, resulted in children and abandonment of, of the children. So you've got, but what, how you are telling it, you've got so many coincident meetings that are starting to sound unbelievable. So I, I would find, a way of how can these people meet without it sounding too coincidental to where it's almost unbelievable but also how 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 they meet and then we see the next meeting it's all it almost becomes a repetitive where oh i was raped and then i abandoned my child and my child is the same age as you. So once we start hearing these things, it starts sounding too predictable. And then we, we find another meeting. It's almost a repeat of the first meeting that, that we, we, we heard. So I, I would ask myself, what story am I telling? Am I telling a story of three people, three women, who are uh, related to each other through a curse, and that curse is uh, the rape. Then, if I if that's the story that you are telling, work on how you you're going to make those uh, their, their relationship, how they are related, not to be too too cheesy in 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 to put it uh, in a in a simpler way. If the story that you are telling is the issue of rape, which results in children and these women not wanting the children because they remind them of what happened to them. Then you've got a central theme, how you relate these people, then you've got more freedom in how you do it, uh, how you can tell that story. But currently I, I find that the struggle that you are having is because of, how you, the story was inspired, where your, your grandmother meets these uh, women and they find that they are related through a curse. So now when we meet this, uh, when, when we have this character meeting this woman, it's almost a repeat of what we've already heard in the, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Charlie. Um, yeah, I think my my note is, is kind of similar, but let me not let me not um, repeat what what the idiot said. Maybe something that could be helpful um, could be the the practice of storylining, right? So deciding whose whose story is the main story, and that's the story that we're following, and then these other stories become intersecting stories that kind of 
become points of intersection because now it's just like we go from one situation to the next situation but there's very little that separates these two situations um i mean uh the girl goes into the the clinic and then she hears a story and then she goes into the the um the meeting and the, the story is the same so it's kind of you know it starts to lose that credibility and then we lose connection with the work so something that could be useful is to think about the the place where they are right and think about the journey that each character takes so i think what might be useful is to write out the journey of each character not as related to the others but just their own journey right so this person goes from this place to that place to that place to that place and then this person goes from that place to that place Place. And at which point could we find maybe it's, it's a chance meeting because they're in the same location and there's something that that causes them to then start asking questions about but what happened to you and what happened to me as opposed to them just um, it's 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 very it's very convenient that the old woman tells this particular story to the child after just encountering her in this clinic right it's like but why why is this old lady telling the story and and why are we why are we actually listening to it unfold in the way that it does so maybe storylining it giving each character their own journey and then figuring out how they interweave might be might be a useful exercise um, and then i just had a bit of a, a challenge with the gap in in time um, that first scene is located at a very distant point in the past and then the immediate next scene we're in this future and like it seems like so much has happened in between that i'm left asking myself too many questions about how did we get here and so I think something that could be useful is uh, starting off with uh, the unities, right? So the unities of place, time, and action, right? So the action needs to move in a chronological sequence. You know, in, in, in film, we have the liberty of jumping settings and locations and times without too much work, right? Because it's literally just a snap from one scene to the next. But with the theater, we need to consider that people are actually following a journey that's going step by step by step. And so, you know, from one situation to the next situation, and I, I think in the second part you do it well you know she goes from one scene where she's sitting in one situation she goes to the next room and the story's continuing but the gap between that first segment and the next segment just causes too many questions for me um, and I think maybe it's a question of um, figuring out what happens in between these two things that can actually help us to fill in so that we're not just dealing with exposition the whole time you know there's you know people are just sitting there telling their stories and at some point for the audience it becomes tedious to keep listening to the same narrative over and over. Um, so there's something really cool that you did in that first segment uh, where you you symbolized the action, right? And I don't know if that was a, uh, as a result of the directing or if it's written into the script like that, but you know, such such devices can help us to show as opposed to telling the same thing repetitive, especially if there's repetition. You know, um, if the repetition is going to come and it's going to be told, we're going to lose interest in it. But then if we realize in the symbol, in the action that this is a repetition of the thing that has just been told then our interest is peaked you know um so i i think just to just to clear up those character journeys and then figure out the um the 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 gap in the unities of time place and action um and then figuring out how to make things a little bit more interesting than just characters talking uh because then it becomes talking heads and then we disengage very quickly especially because it's such an issue that we've seen so many times in so many different ways it's very easy for people to just disengage so we need to create ways that pique the interest. Um, and so I think you can pull us in a little bit more by just focusing in specifically on the journey of who you believe the protagonist to be. But if it's about the theme, then clearing out these three journeys and allowing us to meet them by coincidence, by chance, as opposed to things happening um, in a convenient way for you, the writer, right? Because you know that you want the story to go to this next point, but the audience necess doesn't necessarily know that and they shouldn't know that. So a bit of mystery can be very useful uh, for Re revelation yes great great there was a couple of hands uh mr no yes um, ah, la, la. oh father god finally yeah thank you um mm -hmm. yes i thought um Actually, what Eddie and Agatha uh, said is, is is it's quite very true. And I thought to myself as I was reading, because they have actually outlined all the stuff I was pointing out. And one of the suggestions I made was to say that in it, I think a realistic approach to this story, it it's and the dialogue, the way it goes about, it trivializes the the actual, you know, the the, the depth of the the, the story.
artists have actually experienced. So I thought to myself, maybe if she took the story out of the realistic approach of telling it and stylistically have maybe all these three characters or four characters of women on stage at the same time and they are each in their own world telling their own stories through monologues. You know what I mean? Just a different approach which could somehow get her to not have this convenient coincidence, you know, that makes them just somehow come together. But if she could literally get out of the realistic mentality or the realistic approach of telling the story and think of it as a theater of monologues where they are each telling their own monologues. You can even bring the male character on stage to be listening to what they are saying to under so that the, we could see the male figure going through the experiences of these women and also having to understand that they are the ones who are responsible for all these stories that are being told at the same time. You know, like Katlaho was saying that you could actually outline each story individually and have a trajectory of each story. And I think if you do that, you could even make it monologues, which people are not necessarily having a dialogue. That's what I was thinking, just to try and maybe bring a suggestion to how you could try and solve the problem. But yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's a lot, there's a lot to work through. Um, so yeah, Snovuyo, those are the feedback. So hopefully with everybody else, also you are, you're, you're picking up where we can and, and, and shift in your own work. So some people, uh, some students also submitted stuff, but we're not part of this reading. So I'm encouraging them to also listen up and to hear where else they could move their own stories and shift their own uh, work so that you're not feeling like, oh, but I wasn't part of this. So they're not talking to me. Uh, we are also talking to everybody. All right, so the next up we have um, uh, Nasi P, no mask, no entry. Um, technology, it always hits me, but please forgive me. Uh, I, <laughs> I will try to get it right. <laughs> All right, here we go. you assume that I mean, have morals and self-respect and please don't be selfish and start making this about other people and not me i am not the standard for all women and the choices they make which in some fucked way puts you in a position to question their morals when it's really none of your damn business the doctor interrupts me honey. how may you help me today you want me to lay on the bed um Okay. You know, I remember voluntarily throwing myself in this bed. My eyes filled with love and happiness and body so relaxed. You would have sworn I'd known him for months on edge. His large, heavy breathing body, hands clenching onto mine with my arms spread wide over his bed. His thighs spreading mine open and here I am. I need to get done, Nina. How old am I? Well, I'm 20. Well, 21. Well, no. I'm 22. I'm actually turning 22 this year in September. Am I sexually active? Hey, okay. I'm doing well again, Jamie. No, ma'am. Sisi, when did you push on a lame song at the movie? Oh, and I'm doing it. Bona kali song at the sis. I'm barely sexually active, unless I'm dating someone. And I've just dated two people, but had unprotected sex with both of them. Twice, no, thrice, uh, quadruple times. And the other one constantly yapped about how it wasn't the same. And I could tell it really wasn't the same when my body would after being deeply penetrated, the waterfall of my temples, finding it hard to run dry. You want me to spread my legs a bit more? Um, um, okay, is that fine? I remember asking your son the same thing. I remember telling him a bit more. Okay. Okay, we should be good now, right? Right. You know, telling him to be gentle, okay? When is the last time I got my period? Well, about that. You see, I actually stopped keeping track of my period because I can spot for about two weeks and then my period doesn't come and then maybe the next month it comes. So I really don't remember. 
a pregnancy test. Oh, but there's no need for that. I actually remember how I got it now, two weeks back. Do I use protection when having sex? Of course I do. What? Yes, all the time. You're going to need me to be honest. But I'm being honest, doc. I swear. I swear. It's probably it's probably not even the my last partner who gave me. Okay. And we're back. All right, Nasipi, um, speak back a bit on what's this piece about? Why? <laughs> Quickly, one minute. <laughs> Some um, people okay. know what the piece is about. <laughs> um, so no marks, no entry. Uh, essentially, it's a piece about not, not sexual harassment, but things that happen unconsented, and but not in a... When, okay, sexual harassment, but it's not violently done. So I'm trying to put uh, a spotlight on that. The fact that you don't need to be thrown in a bush for it to happen. And my apologies if this is a sensitive topic for someone. So, but like, how, how then are women affected by these little instances, yet they are so big internally? Because technically it still happened to her, even though it's not of the magnitude where other people can be sympathetic towards the person and all of that. Yeah, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, Fisher. Um... Um, so I really, I really like your, your writing. So as in your voice, I really like, I think you have a very, um, a very beautiful voice. Um, I liked the, the title. I mean, I, I, interpreted as no mask, no entry, as a no condom, no play, um, because the prevalent theme for me I picked up was um, STDs more than, yeah. um, more than Literally. actually um, yeah. consent. Um, but now that you speak about consent, I think um, you're, and then also you open up, when you open up, you say that the character is quite humble, um, yeah. but that's not what I get from the, from the character. The character is very pre presumptuous, um, babbles on and on and on and on and for me it mm. became difficult to follow through um, and thanks to 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 our dear doctor who shared the actual scripts I could then read and not just watch um, because okay. I was it was really difficult for me to just follow through um, from one thought to to the other um, I think um, just a few notes I'm not gonna go into into all of it um yeah i think if if you're gonna write um yeah so one of the questions i had here was is she really feeling anger or shame um so which one is it um define define the emotion in which your your character is 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 playing from um and then that will help you you guide the the dialogue in terms of what she's saying what she chooses to say what she chooses not to say um, and then I also said she she becomes she stops becoming believable um, when she becomes too presumptuous. So when there are moments where she's saying things to the to the um, doctor that I don't think if you were in a in a room or if you went to a clinic and you were in a room with a doctor and you had um, an STI or an mm -hmm. STD, that's what you would feel. Mm -hmm. So maybe just relook. Um, some of those um and then i i also said um i'm still not clear on on her relationship with with the with the guy um mm. yeah so maybe clarify that for me as well um and then i said this works it does work um well as a as a monologue um but find moments where she's silent find moments where she's thinking out loud um and not necessarily speaking um what she's saying mm. yeah Thank you, ma'am. Um, if, if I may, um, yeah, I, I totally agree with um, uh, Swangida's uh, summation. Um, so I think what, what that, that, that thing of like, for example, uh, it's, it's called stealthing, ne? Uh, mm. That, yeah. Um, so so I, I, I think for me, the, the difficulty is also in like, figuring out where where she's at internally um like how is she actually feeling about what what actually happened to her um because i'm not really clear on why she volunteers so much information um which kind of 
I feel like betrays the setting that she's in. Um, I feel like certain things you wouldn't just volunteer unless they had been asked. Um, and it's a very uncomfortable space, but I'm not getting the sense of discomfort for her. Mm. It feels like, you know, she's, you know, just here for a general checkup, you know, and like, and uh, by the way, this happened to me and this happened to me. So then it kind of loses uh, the sense of stakes for, for her. Um, so I think if, if, if I could, if I could suggest something, maybe to remove um, the, you know, when someone asks you a question, you won't necessarily repeat the question before you answer it. Um, and sure. I think you're, do you're doing this a lot for your audience because you want them to, to know what has been asked. But I think if you can find ways to present the question and the answer, um, then we'll, we'll, we'll stay following, you know, with her because then we can have an opportunity to see how the question affects her. Um, because yeah. if, if, if it's just, when did I have sex you know we don't really get to see but if it's sorry um it was you know and then we can get into like the nature of what she's feeling right so preempting um i, I think what what Swingle is right, is saying is right in that there's there's presumption and like she's being very anticipatory and i think it's robbing the audience of the the emotional journey that she's going through um so if i think if, if we can dial back on um the repetition of the question and have and if, if you look at it the answers actually do reveal what the question was um and if they don't do it fully it's okay to have a little bit of mystery you know with your audience asking okay. themselves but what because that causes us to lean in a little bit more you know because we want to know what what is what she's been asked and why she's um re responding or reacting in in the way that she she does um and then yeah so my, my thing was just like why is she why is she constantly so chatty you know in this in this particular space you know it doesn't feel like yeah. a space where one just speaks and just shares and tells and tells and tells and tells unless for example if the context is like a therapy you know where you're getting mm -hmm. rid of all of these emotions and like you're you're allowing yourself to purge but to the doctor i don't think that you'd be as revealing and then i just have a question about um i haven't seen the script who how many people are in the room how many people is she answering questions to? Uh, she's answering just to the doctor, but there just are one. people. Oh, I see. Passing, yeah, it's just one person. I see. I see. Okay, maybe just to clarify, to clarify that because it wasn't clear in the performance that yep. it feels like there's a panel that is interrogating her, and you know she's just being kind of aloof about about the whole thing. So um, just to clarify that, um, and have the doctor's script uh -huh. set, and then have her script kind of set so that it's an engagement between a one-on-one. -on -one. And I think that that can heighten things even more okay. if, if we're clear that it's a one thing shooting questions at you and you being affected yeah. by them and then having to offer truthful responses. Um, yeah, and then does she care about what's going on? Does she really, really care about what's what's happening? Uh -huh. here? Because I'm getting a sense that, you know, it's, it's kind of like it's just nothing for her. So maybe just have a look at that. I think I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. So just to um, uh, read out some comments um, from Swingida, what is the internal conflict and what is the arc of this journey to the external conflict in your story? So that is a big question and has some same notes around changing the setting from the doctor's room to a therapist's room. So there's there's also there's uh -huh. a change of gender in what you're saying. You say she, she, so it changes. Um, Bobby, uh, you had a, a hand up. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, thank, thanks, Rafira. Um I, I don't know. I think for me, because of what um, Nasipi just explained at the opening, I was like nodding a lot because I'm also, I also tend to gravitate towards the gray areas of 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 sexual assault uh, mm -hmm. because it's such a, a it's a very tricky thing to even address. So her chattiness for me just spoke of someone who's trying to navigate um, what happened. Uh, that they not they not even entirely sure that they didn't like what happened or if they even said no, like there's there's just a turmoil that goes on when you when you experience such a thing. That for me it was realistic that she would just be offering this information and trying to sound sassy. And there's this whole thing now of reowning our sexuality as women that uh, maybe sometimes I will dress in a provocative manner just so I can reclaim the p word. Or, or whatever, right? But mm. uh, when I'm inside myself or I'm alone, do I really believe some of these protests that I'm 
trying to put out there, taking into consideration the backlash that I'm going to receive. So maybe if I'm with a doctor, I might just offer up this information that, oh, you know, I'm sexually active, I like sex, or maybe I don't or whatever, but like the jumbled up thoughts or the, the chattiness for me just spoke to that whole thing that, you know what, this woman was experienced this, she's not saying it, now she has these consequences to, to so it, I, mean, I just wanted to say, the chatting has kind of made sense for me because you don't know what to do with yourself when you've been sexually active. All right, all right. Thank you That's for that. Yes, and um, um, just you know, one. Can I add? Uh, I'll I'll be very very quick. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I I actually do agree with you, Zinte. Uh, for me, I think Nasip, what you could do, uh, is the questions. We don't obviously we don't really have you don't have to repeat the questions, but the questions, them, the questions themselves could be what drives her to, to offer the, the where she's starting mm -hmm. to, 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 to ramble. But it needs to be, it needs to be where, you know, where you feeling like the question are judgmental towards me. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you get asked the question, you respond to it so that we see this is an uncomfortable thing, but it gets okay. to a point where now you are offering, it's almost like, oh, that's overshare. But we know mm -hmm. that there's emotion behind you oversharing that. That way the mm -hmm. audience gets to hear uh, the, the whole story, but it's driven by something. She has been pushed towards telling yeah. it all. So the chattiness isn't just somebody who's just, Chatty, 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 uh, chatty as if mm. she is not really affected by yeah. by what happened, and I I I like that it's a fine line, but when it gets to that point where she feels judged by this doctor mm. who is actually almost it, it it's almost invasive because yeah. why is his job to do that? But he's like finding things in there and mm. then posing questions at you. So that's mm. where the line gets blurred from him uh, just being a doctor. And it's like, I'm finding things in here and I'm asking you questions. And that could drive this, uh, this lady to that point. Then it's justified. Mm. Right. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, a lot to think about and a lot to to consider everyone in terms of also thinking about how do you pose questions, especially with monologues and the next part that mm -hmm. we're going into monologues. And I think that was a challenge for, um, <laughs> for everyone. With what is a monologue? What is a story? What is the story of the monologue? How do I tell the story in a monologue? What do you mean? I must tell the story by the singular human. Um, and so the next up, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have monologues from the third years. Um, and we're going to uh, watch three monologues at a time. So the three we're going to watch is The Sacrifice by Busisiwe Makola. And we're going to watch The Turmoil of My Decision by Akama Ngozi and Bikes and Tries by Ntabise Ndiko. So Ntabise Ndiko is not here. Um, so, but we can, so when we feedback, uh, colleagues, we can feedback to all three at the same time. And then, um, yeah, the time saying is not here, but we can feed back to all three at the same time. All right. Um, okay, let me share. I mean, you're getting married and she's carrying your daughter. Mandla, you're kidding, right? You're joking. Tell me you are joking. Manda, no, 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 you can't do this. Manda, after everything, after everything I've confronted in you about my sister and my entire family. Mandla, you know exactly the kind of a person my sister is and the hell her and my parents put me through. Mandla, you can't be doing this. 
you can't be the one telling me this and doing this to me right now. After everything I've done for you, for this marriage, after everything I've sacrificed for this marriage to work and to make you happy. Mandla, I had hopes. I had hopes that maybe one day you will change. That maybe one day you'll be a good man, the man you were before. That you will stop, that you will stop messing around with those women and sleep at home with me, your wife. I had hopes that maybe one day we will be happy again. And that you realize my worth and start loving me, Mandla, start wanting me and, and seeing me, the woman you fell in love with and married. Mandla, I'm born with. You don't see me. The only thing you see is how fat I've become. And you know the reason for that, Mandla. It's because I carried your son. I gave you an heir, an heir I thought you always wanted. But no, you turned around and spit on my face. You, you called me useless and called our child rubbish. Mandla, there's nothing I wanted more than just to, to give you an heir. When, when I found out I was pregnant, I jumped for joy, thinking to myself, Indo Dayami, Yong Tanda, Indo Dayami, Iyo Jabula. Because I'll be giving him the greatest gift of all. God when I realized how much he made you angry, I made a sacrifice for you again, like I always do. Mandla, I, I killed my own son. No. No. All right, and then next up is turmoil of my decision. The character is Mahuna. He is a 36-year-old married man who works in Kimberley as a geologist. He blames himself for the death of his father and he wants to prove that he is a man. Setting. Within their bedroom, he's sitting at the corner of a sideboard holding a frame of a wedding picture that sits on the dressing table. Look at your smile. Warm. Home. It is home. Our home. You built it. From the ground you built it. At Kumile, you have been building ever since you tiptoed in my life, wearing those most serious pens I have ever seen. But they look good on you. Everything looks good on you. Being your wife looks good on you. That should never be taken away from you. You deserve it. You deserve a happy life, a happy home, a security, a husband that will always be here for you. You deserve this life. But what am I going to do? My decisions have all failed me. I'm stuck. Perplexed in my decisions that are bearing maggots. 
my wife, I have fallen off. I have dismantled my house and the house that you built for us, destroyed your home. My decisions have pushed the intels of my heart and now I am only holding on by the umbilical cord of our unborn baby. How do I now tell you this? How does a man tell his pregnant wife that he has fallen in love with someone else? How do I tell you that for the first time in my life, I've met someone who sees me and I see her too. A person who sees me as someone is not as someone's husband or son. He's nothing like a home. She's not a place. She's a chain and together we are discoverers. At my age, I never knew there was something beyond being a man, provider and protector. There is something in sitting down and having meaningless but yet full conversations. My heart bleeds. I can taste my blood in my throat, rushing up my temples. This decision is not a walk on a plateau. My love, my life is a meander. Difference is it has become an oppression. Nothing flows and nothing goes. And so I shall stay too. Ryan Gosling, Ryan Gosling, from all the months that I have, you know, gotten to know you, I have gotten to know the real you, and you're a prick, a dickhead, but the way that your dimples grow with each smile you make and little bites that you take with each muffin that you have every morning that be baked, by the way. You are probably a husband, a father to like three kids. I don't know, Harold, Sally, and Harry, or whatever, but I am in love with you. And I know that I'm incriminating myself with the speech and the intent in my eyes could scare you away, but I just want you, you little self-absorbed prick to know that I love you. And sadly, there isn't anything I can do about it besides, you know, watches the agony lessons. Ryan Gosling, from all the months that I have gotten to know you, I have gotten to know the real you, and you are a cute prick. Okay. And we're back. All right. So we have Akamangozi and um, what was the other one? Busisiwe Mako. Busisiwe Akama. So Akama earlier. Sorry, please repeat. Hi. All right. No, I just want um if you, I just wanted to find you so I can pin you onto the <laughs> onto the main screen. That's it. But I hear you speaking, but it's fine. So um can you just speak quickly one minute each? So maybe uh Busisi will start and just tell us uh, um what was the piece for you and why. And um, as you can see, we have a lot of uh, relationship problems. Eh? <laughs> People, <laughs> <laughs> we have lots of relationship problems. People, um, Jolo is not for the young. All right, we'll see where... <laughs> let's go my right on. Okay, so this piece is about um, this lady who sacrificed her own son he killed his own son because his husband um her husband used to like complain about how he has how he, she has changed how smelly the house has been since the baby has arrived so this husband wanted 
a baby girl. I mean, yeah, a baby girl, but the woman got a son. So she decided to sacrifice the son in order to make her husband happy. This is a kind of woman who is really desperate. She has absolutely nothing outside this marriage. She could do anything in order to make this marriage work. This marriage is everything that she got. She was never the parent's favorite. So now if she can go back home, she will be a laughing stock. And this husband now has decided to marry her sister. And apparently the sister is now pregnant with a, a baby girl, something that she failed to do. So the sister had everything. The sister was the favorite child while this lady didn't have anything, was the black sheep of the family. So now this marriage is everything that she's got. With the husband, it was the only time she felt love, she felt appreciated. But honestly, the husband didn't really love her. She just felt sorry for her. So now right. she's really like holding no, on to this thank marriage. You, yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Akama? Hello, everyone. Um, for me, I'll talk about the inspiration. Uh, this is inspired by a conversation, and I overheard a conversation on the phone of this young um, Kosa woman when I was coming to Pretoria. She was talking on the phone, um, talking about how her husband has cheated on her, and her husband is staying with this woman, and they have a child, and he's not even bothered and how she's going to fight for her husband. She doesn't care, whatever, whatever. So I wanted to show the perspective of the husband. What if he fell in love, understanding how Kosa men are raised as you <laughs> must find must do all those things, and then you must have a wife. And what if, what if as you grow up, you learn about yourself and you know what you actually prefer? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, colleagues, yes, and, and and everybody else, please, audiences. I know you're sitting there. You, I mean, we watched most of these uh, of the monologues, so do share. Tabi saying Diko is not here, so she can't speak back to her piece. Um, uh, she couldn't be present with us, but we holding we are holding her very dearly. So we'll give her feedback. Whatever you've written, we will send it to her. But for now, let's speak back to Busisiwe and Akama. Um, very quickly, I know it's, time has gone, and wow, time flies when we're having fun. So we've got two more, and then we're we're going to be done. So yes, very quickly, let's speak back to Busisiwe. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, okay, um, so with with the the sacrifice, um, I, I I like well maybe just like a general note um, in terms of monologues that I've found to be helpful. Um, it's always nice when there's um, it's clear who who the monologue is being presented to, right? So like uh, casting your audience um, can be a very nice um, device to use, right? So making the audience another character in the story can be a lovely way to uh, deal with questions of setting, questions of credibility, questions of understanding why we are in the context that we're in. Um, and so I I, I like that um, it's it's kind of clear that you know we are a mandla in in this in this context. Um, I, I'm just missing, okay, so the death of a child, right, the murder of a child, um, I feel like is something that, okay, and I, I need to be careful with my language here, but as writers, we need to earn moments like that. Um, and I, I just feel like in terms of building up the anguish to the point that she felt like the only choice that she had was to murder her child i'm i'm kind of missing why why she feels like that right like what what is it that this guy has on her to the point that she's willing to kill her only child right i i i i i get that you know he wanted a daughter and he's been treating her very badly i'm just curious about why the the decision that she takes as a result of that is and i hear you speaking about the desperation but i think the anguish can be built up a little bit more um for example if we look at you know the old tragedy 
Medea, when she kills her sons, it's as a last resort after, you know, everything has collapsed to the point that she's about to lose her kids. And instead of giving them up to, to Jason and, you know, the, the new wife, she kills them, you know, and, and she kills everybody in that action, right? And so I feel like, you know, if, if that is going to be the thing, it's, and it's, it's tragic, it's a beautiful kind of setup, you know, um, but I just feel like I, I'm not entirely sure why her only option is killing killing her son um and maybe maybe i missed it maybe it's, it's a question of you know looking at the text again um and then on top of that you know are there any consequences for this you know what is what are the consequences for this action in this world right because you know murder is something huge and now it's the murder of it of, of your own child you know and is she oblivious to the fact that this thing that she has born herself you know how did she feel about the child you know uh why was she okay with 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 choosing the husband over the son so like this that that tension for me is just something that um i think just needs a bit of clarity um and then not to waste too much time let me jump into uh the turmoil of my decision uh i love the 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 use of the ge geological language um in terms of you know this guy speaking about how he's this unmovable rock right and he's just going to stay in this in this situation i think it's 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 a lovely way to also sketch the world that we're in and show um the the inner inner life of the character because they're speaking from a frame that makes sense to them right so they're speaking from a language of geology right and he speaks about this meandering and i i feel like that's a, a very nice use of of language um and um yeah, so with with a monologue to to jump onto that that metaphor, it's it's useful to think of a monologue as like something that you're building, right? So like you 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 stack things on top of each other, kind of like layers. And this for the actor will be like gear shifts, right? So with the monologue, it's literally mano a mano with the audience. So it has to be something that pulls us in the now. And so to lay the ground and then to switch things up level by level as you're building this this building of yours it could be useful also in how the performance comes out and i think that this is the kind of monologue that an actor will love because they're going to get riled up you know as a result of it but at the end and i think it, it's lovely if you can build it up to the point that we think he's going to to leave her but then he stays you know so just just to play with those dynamics of of tempo and rhythm i think it could really lift us out you know a little bit more i'll stop there Thank you. Felix? Okay. Oh, Hulisani, you're still. Oh, Hulisani had a hand up. Yes, Huli. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. I I just wanted to go back to the sacrifice and sort of try and understand um just what's in what state of mind is this lady at this point when she's telling the story? Because I'd like to believe that there could be some psychological problem here that could be you know, dealt with in a sense that no one just decides to, to say, I'm going to kill my child out of desperation for a man. And this person is in their sound mind. I think there is some psychological mental problem that this story could explore. You know what I mean? And also the setting, where is this? And where is she at this point? You know, is she home? Is she in a mental institution? Is she in prison? You know, I think, yeah, those are some of the questions that needs to be clarified. As much as the, 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 the twists are very sudden and thrilling, but yeah, it, it, it really needs a proper build up, like, like Katlaka was saying. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Can, can I, can I just, Jump in. Jump in there. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm I'm just jumping in because actually for me, um, the killing of the child was very plausible. So it's not something that I, I argued with. I, I actually understood because um at first I, I when I was when I was um listening, I was thinking, how old is this child? Is she speaking about abortion? <laughs> but then I realized that no, this is a child who's potentially between one, two, or three months old. Um, and and Often enough, what's not spoken about in society is uh, postpartum depression. Um, and often enough, it's the results of postpartum depression. So a mental illness um, coupled with isolation as a result of emotional abuse. Because um, what I got is that this, this man is emotionally abusive to even have the wife sit there 
I mean, the sister sit there with the stomach and all of that um, seemed like someone who is very emotionally abusive. And so I didn't have much of an issue with with the killing, but I do agree with Katleo and Hulisan in that it's not earned. So it's, it's, it's not earned in that we are not taken through the journey of how she actually struggles um, with this depression, with this choice that she has to make between her husband, who's unloving, who potentially, depending on how long they've been married, she despises to a certain point, even though she is attached to him. Um, and this child who could give her this love that she's, she never got um, from her, her parents, but also that kind of despise she has for this child because of the traumas of giving birth. So I think it's, I, I do agree with earning that moment or that revelation. Um, I think for me, I just quite didn't understand the role, like her journey, her emotional journey from disbelief, despair, rage, shame, humiliation to desperation. Um, and when does she direct it to Manja? And when does she direct it to the sister who's also in the, in the room? And what is the relationship with that sister and that other character that's in the room? Because the minute a body enters a space, um, it affects it affects how you how emotionally a character reacts or moves around or the action that they have to take. So I think for me, um, yeah, my note would be just to consider everyone in the space um, and how she she relates to them and how she moves from that journey of disbelief, despair, rage, shame, humiliation to ending up with um, desperation. Um, and then just quickly on um, the, the other one, I really liked... Um, I like that perspective of, of, because we can't control falling in love. No one can control falling in love. And once you married, one of your biggest fears is that your partner will fall in love and you can't hold it against them <laughs> if they fall in love with someone else because they can't control that. Um, I really like that. Um, but I felt like um, you could play a little bit more on that duplicity of, of, of um, the emotions. Um, is he in love with both of them um, and more potentially infatuated and excited by this new love? Or has he completely fallen out of love with his wife, in which case he's acting from a, an emotion of excitement? Um, because when you're, when you're in love, like you're excited, you're excited about your love, even though you still, you're like, oh my God, I still have this other person I have to tell. But every time I think about this person, there's, there's joy. So I think um, it's difficult with a monologue because it relies a lot on the unwritten so and it relies a lot on emotion on that emotional journey and that internal conflict or yeah that internal emotional journey or arc of your characters so i think for both of you if you can delve deeper into into um your characters and and what they're going through when you tell that story um it can tie it in and yeah to huli and gato's point um in in that revelation or that yeah that big reveal at the end Uh, just a, a brief note, uh, it's a general note, both uh, Akama and Busisiwe. When, just from a, a, a writing point of view, because I believe my colleagues have, uh, have made enough uh, notes about the content of the, the monologues. When you, you, you are writing the monologue, strip it off uh, of dialogue that's on the nose where you feel like you are basically telling the audience information that you information that you think we need to hear in order to understand what's happening or in order to understand the character because if your character is with somebody within the scene and they are repeating by the moment they get to to the point of the monologue, a lot has happened already. And it's a lot, it's things that both of them know happen. Mm -hmm. So if you tend to repeat things that this person that the character is talking to within the monologue is something that has already happened, those are facts. You don't have to tell us facts. Tell us the emotions behind the facts, the reactions behind the facts. We, we want to, mm -hmm to grab the facts from how they, 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 they respond to each other. 
so that it's not just linear as if we you are watching um, a news broadcast. So find things that you can strip your monologue off and rather ask how does she feel about what happened? And you will see it will guide how you then write your, your dialogue as to say. So just find that way of, of doing it rather than what do I want the audience to find out about what happened? Great, great. Yeah, um, I think monologues are a challenge because uh, sometimes, like for example, we are asking students to write, uh, you know, to, to, to pick up, to create a story out of, <laughs> you know, they haven't created the world. So, so they have to literally have to build up a world and then choose a moment in time in this world where this monologue could happen. And I think it's a skill and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a story. It's a, it's, it's a lot of things that are coming in um, but I'm hoping that uh, we will be able to to clarify. But it it is a it is an interesting thing that you're saying that there's so much more that has happened in the story. There's something the story is going somewhere else, and the writer knows all of these things. But in this moment in time, what is the what is so important right now that this becomes the thing that stands out that we can pull out and use as the monologue, or that can um, highlight something. So thank you so much for those. Um, and then finally, we have the last two. The last two, the one is called The Final Act <laughs> and The Mystery of Chicken's Heights. So we will um, start with The Mystery of Chicken Heights and then go to the final act because I think if we're gonna end, let's end with the final act. So uh, we will move to The Mystery, okay. What uses the license now? No, I mean the chicken, a useless pilot that fears heights. You know, man, my story begins to go high in Jatin. If I take you, I used to be a young and ambitious boy, boy, full of intelligence. I mean, I went to the Tebepele Primary where I got top three achievers awards. I also went to Tabelo Sorobe High School where I was top of my grades in academics. I even earned myself a bazaar with George Bosman Bazaar to study aviation in the University of Qatar. But I might as well tear up my, 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 my pilot license from there. Instead, here I am on some stupid far, far away land to drink dragon's blood. I mean, what is dragon's blood anyway? Tell me, what if it doesn't even exist? I'm an incomplete man. Yeah. The only thing I want to drink is half case of black juice, the court. That's the only escape from the music community that I live in. And I also have a fear, man. I fear his heights. You know, my fear of heights began when I was a fresh young man at the tender age of eight, when I was carried by the leg, there dangling by my grandfather's best friend, twin brother, He felt it necessary to take me all the way to the third floor of his flat in town and demonstrate to them an alternative way to kill a chicken without using a murder weapon. I was completely terrified. So much so that I wet the bed that night. And guess what? They all just stuck out their big rotten teeth and they laughed. Even my dad and my dad, he laughed. Oh, and I also had a wife. Kusei. Oh man, bless her soul. She has done the best that I could possibly ask of her. Supporting me and the kids financially. But she's also tired of my cowardly fear of height, man. She's leaving me for the young chief at the village. Just imagine, 16 years of marriage down the drain. Who am I, man? Hmm? I spent eight days in a bus, three on a train, 11 hours walk and now I'm on a boat made of pumpkins on the way to some far, far away land to drink dragon's blood. There's no shoes, no jacket. Kuchu, 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 kuchu. Chicken is imitating the drink vehemently. There's no winter head and yet the temperature keeps on dropping day by day. 
no root for fire, no vodka, not even a sign of smoke, man, to see that I don't know It's all just water and these damn pumpkins. And I'm quickly running out of food. Looking into his cuff tin and feels exasperated. You see, all that I have left now are three slices of stale bread, masonja I7, quarter liter of water, and a chippies. No. This is the price that I have to pay for chasing my dreams. Because turning back is not an option, as it provides only death and more suffering. I mean, it's night time now, and my stomach is busy making a moaning sound. All that I can see is a mist. Hang on. I see a light ahead. Could it be? Impossible. I mean, I knew what I had come here for. The thought of it alone was enough to convince myself of its existence. But the sight of it, to finally realize that everyone was wrong about this place. Bang! The boat hit something hard. And no! The Final Act by Chris Matsepe, directed by Mpohamar. The name of the character is Samuel Piri, who is 36 years old. His occupation is a floor manager at a local cash and carry. The Final Act is set in a one-room shack and is about Samuel, a floor manager at a local cash and carry. He was found hanging dead by suicide. His son, 11 years old, found near him with a letter that reads. I guess I'm going out like my father. I was 11 years old. He came into the room with a bucket and a rope, hung the rope and hanged himself. My father used to perform tricks for me. I remember this trick he used to do with a kitty sand. He pulled lots of them in his ear, pull, pull, and pull. I didn't know how he did it, but I knew. I didn't know how to do it. It was this day at school. I was shot with kitty sands. I tried to pull them from my ear like my father did. I kept on trying and, and trying and, and trying, but still nothing. But that day, there was something about his egg. He told me it's the final piece. As usual, I was not allowed to disturb his egg. But something was missing. I was tempted to disturb the egg. I wanted to put the bucket back under his feet. He was gasping for air. He, his eyes were so red, he, his legs shaking. When the piece was over, I didn't love nor be moved. My dad didn't move. He froze. Just like how he does after each and every act, I waited for three minutes for him to break character, but he never did. I got up, I moved towards him to ask him if his son Essa had so many questions about the egg. It was so confusing and so scary, but my father didn't respond. I pushed him over and over. I shouted, Dad, Dad. I shouted, Dad, seven times. The last call must have triggered my mother. I heard my mother outside saying, Peter, the child is calling for you. I shouted the last dad with tears in my eyes. My voice was in distress. My mother walked in, same time she screamed. And she told me to go fetch a knife. I ran like my life depended on it. Little did I know that I was too late. Yes, it's true. Children will always follow their parents' blueprint. Wow. 
All right. And we have Mutusi Mashiko and uh, Chris Matsipe. All right. All right, so uh, Mutusi and Chris, quickly, um, why this piece? Yeah, very quickly. Oh, yeah. Hi, everyone. How are you? I'm on Zoom. I made it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So the point was to be, be as weird as you can be. It was every three, three, three minutes of writing. Come up with something weirder, something that beats the other thing. I feel like that's the point with me. Just, just be weird. But this is about a man who, who's in a desperate attempt to try to save his marriage, right? So he's in this precarious situation whereby now he has to, well, he's a qualified pilot. He has to, he has to get rid of his fear of heights. You know what I mean? So he has to go drink Dremont's blood. He doesn't think that this thing is real. He, it's like, what? What am I doing actually? I don't even know where it's gonna go, but the point was just to be weird. I wanna become the weirdest person, I suppose. I don't know. Thank you. Chris Cabello. Oh, hello everyone. Um, the final act, uh, my piece I based it. I don't know if you can hear me. I have problem with network. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. I based my piece. Uh, I based my piece basically on a family receipt. Have I heard of something like it's a family receipt, pass it down to the next generation, to the next generation, and so on. So now, basically, there are three characters, which is there are three fathers: the father of Samuel, and also Samuel is a father to his son. So now, Samuel wanted to cut down the family curse to stop, not for it to continue going to the next generation. So, yeah. Ish, I don't know, but yeah. Thank you. That's no, fine. <laughs> All right, let's yeah. So these are very um yeah, it's very interesting relationships uh, and curses. Uh, things happen, yeah. All right, colleagues. Um, as a closing, yes, and then also um I, I think I've got like, wanted to speak a bit around um, but maybe we'll have a moment of that. Okay, I'll 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 bring it in later. All right, just quickly as we close, I know it's for everyone and people, yeah, we've, thank you, you know, you've been here, you've been here. So, arqualing, arqualing with a bang, thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, Mutusi, well, I struggled to hear a bit. Uh, the, the sound was not that good on, on the clip, but yeah, okay, all I can say is that even if you wanted to be weird, but still have a plan so that there's a thread, we're able to follow your weirdness. Even if you, there's what they call, uh, you need to have a method to your madness. So please, please, as much as some of the places that we love are those crazy weirdest places. But I tell you, there is a plan and there's an aim that somebody wants, the writer wants to, to achieve in there. So I, I'm not gonna try and uh, censor you, you wanting to be weird, but just have a method to, to, to your weirdness. So I missed a lot in, 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 in that because it was not that clear, but I just wanted to say that from what you said. And Chris, the, the story is so beautiful. Uh, I know it's a sad thing, but you're saying that the character wanted to stop the curse. For me, I actually thought he is continuing the curse. <laughs> I thought he is also going to, <laughs> to, 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 to kill uh, himself. But I just love how you told the story. It's simple, but it's, it's not too predictable, you see. So you took a thing of tricks, how, your, uh, how the, the dead plays tricks and just putting myself in that young boy's uh, shoes, thinking this is another 
is another trick. And I also like how the name, uh, the title plays uh, with that, the final act. So that, I, I, I think it's, it's just beautiful. But I, I don't understand the, how he, he was going to end the curse. Maybe that could be clearer because I thought he's continuing the curse. He's also, because you said uh, uh, you follow in your father's footsteps. And I thought, okay, he means he's also going to take his own life. Anybody else, audience members? Okay, um, yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Okay, I'll start with um, the, I, I, I really like the mystery of Chicken's Heights. Um, I really love weird shit. Like I have a bias for anything that's weird. Um, but to echo um, Eddie, um, I think I still didn't like it. It still it was still a bit unclear. I had to go read it, and and I think maybe I was fortunate to actually read it to understand the journey. What I really like is um, Sesotho culture is filled with a lot of mythology around dragons, um, especially around the mountains. So I think it would have been nice to also explore knowing um, the relations between um, Basotho and Batswana um, to kind of explore that, explore the dragon's blood, making it real. Um, and then when I read, like it was unclear watching it, but when I read the piece, there was a lot of padding as well in there. So there's things like where he says, um, I don't know if the blood is... Um, exists like that can be a nugget that can be an action that can be a thing that he actually finds out it's not a thing you have to feed us um the audience but i really liked your character i think he's very quirky um i think there's an absurdity and like a comicalness to him that you can mine a little bit more um i love the absurdity that his wife is leaving him because he's afraid of heights um i think people leave people for the weirdest of things. Um, and I think if you play around those, that absurdity, um, I think then it can make your weirdness or the weirdness of the play um, very um, believable. I also like the play on chicken as in chi like the personification of chicken and what chickens are known for. So I liked that he's this um, afraid person. What didn't come out clearly for me was that if he's this like cowardice, drunkard person who is left alone in a boat um, on, on, on a river at like 2 a.m. in the morning, like his fear must be so heightened. Um, so I think the language use there also can, like the choices that he makes and the things that he focuses on, um, I think that you can play on that a little bit more. Cool. Um, and then, um, Chris, I really like your, it's so sad. I love your story. Um, I, I like both your pieces. I think it's a nice way to end this. I like everyone's stories, but I think it's a nice way to end with yours. I really mm. like the final act as well. It's such yeah. a beautiful, a beautiful story. Um, but I think you created such a complex, such a difficult um, moment or storyline or through line, which is this child finding his father dead by suicide, right? And I wasn't clear, is, is he also dead or is he not dead? This boy, like I, I'm, I'm not sure who's who's reading uh, the letter because it's a letter. Who's reading the question. actual letter? Who's reading the letter? Yeah, the, the person who's reading the actual letter is the 11 year old boy. Okay, it wasn't mm. clear to me. Mm. See, that's mm. that's that was not clear mm. to me because at some point I thought he's also dead next to to the to the like I wasn't. It wasn't clear to me like who's reading um, the, because the emotions were not clear. And I think that's why it wasn't clear to me who's reading the letter. Um, so the dead person's letter, that's clear. That journey is clear. Why he's dead, that is clear. But um, the person, the story is not with that. The story is how it affects the person reading the letter because how it affects that person is the journey we as the audience are going to go through so um i think i think maybe switch that perspective um in terms of yeah directing us in terms of or guiding us as the audience in terms of the the 11 year old boy because i it wasn't clear for me how reading certain things affected him yeah. um 
yeah i wasn't quite sure there but overall i really loved both your um both your pieces i remembered we didn't give the other lady feedback but i think that's fine because we'll yeah. she's not there but yeah let me keep it short and sweet so that everyone can have their piece um yeah i also really enjoyed uh both pieces um i think um, what what I wasn't sure about in the mystery of Chicken Heights, I can see that he's on a journey to go and get this this dragon's blood, right? So I know what he wants, but I'm I'm not entirely clear on like what he needs, right? So like what is what is the motive that causes him to go on this journey? Is it so that he can get his wife back? Is it so that he can overcome the the fear of the heights? Is it so that he can you know? So what is what is the motive behind? the entire journey. That's the only thing that I'm missing, but I love his apprehension. I love his irritation. Um, I love the fact that there's there's this other character who never speaks, you know, it's like this mystical character who's just rowing the thing, you know, and it's just like, we're going somewhere, but we don't really know what's going. And like that absurdity of a pilot who's afraid of heights, you know, there's lovely things that are contrasting that are at play here, but I'm just missing the motive. You know, why has he taken this journey? At the end of the day, what does he hope it will achieve for him um i think if, if that can be cleared up then that would be lovely and then i think you you have an opportunity at the beginning um to play with the awkwardness between the two um between you know the the gentleman and the rower you know in maybe asking a question that doesn't get answered you know building up his frustration until he pops and then he starts revealing all of this other stuff um yeah just some just as like another layer to add awkwardness between these two these two entities um uh, perhaps the question and then yeah and then the final act i also really like it it's very it's harrowing um this this idea of the inheritance or the passing down of this traumatic experience i think it, it also resonates with, with the other piece with the um the the curse that that we spoke about um but yeah my my biggest thing was who's reading this letter and why is it being read aloud um i'm, I'm I don't know, you know, if it's the kid who's there, how how is it affecting him that he's reading this suicide letter that is kind of, you know, a family history. You know, it's not your 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 normal suicide letter that says, you know, my wife, my son, I failed you, I can't do this thing anymore. It's it's a detailed history of what led to this moment. And so how it is presented then um is a question for me because you know he's he's eleven. He's just found his dad. A lot okay, of the things that the dad, you know, describes in there, I believe would be his experience of like, Bob, you know, just like to, to, to have, am I back? back? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so who's reading the letter and why aloud? And then maybe my last question, maybe to complicate things, what action could you have aside from reading? Um, you know, what could be what we are seeing as the audience aside from the reading, because the letter already gives us the information, it gives us the facts. So how could we stylize how the information is brought across to the audience so that this the cycle becomes a, a lot clearer, right? And then I also thought that he was just going to continue the cycle and become the third generation in, so it wasn't clear for me that he wants to break that cycle. Um, so yeah, just thinking about those those things, you know, theaters is the audience's art. So, you know, how is this information being transferred from, you know, this, the, the stage to the audience beyond just reading the letter? And I think, yeah. That's, that's awesome, awesome. Love it, love it, love it. Um, so I hope everybody got that. Theater is the audience's art. Yes, 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 yes. Pulisani, quickly, quickly. Okay, quick one. Um, thank you. Quite interesting stories, both of them. They they they're really intriguing. Um, just something that just came to my mind as Katla was asking his last question was that um if we could maybe be literal, I'll, I'm just going to give you a literal uh, example of what he's referring to. Imagine that 11-year-old boy uh, standing on a chair or a bucket, whatever, cutting the rope, you know, that supposedly could have been a rope that he could be hanging, he should have hung himself with maybe later in his life. But on that case, he's literally saying this, trying to cut that rope, you know, that could be, like he's saying, you know, we write for audience. We 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 make stories. We create stories for the audience. So obviously, there has to be some action that complements or either overemphasize or 
under, you know, go as an undertone of what we are saying. And then um, the other story, mystery of the chicken sides. That's a very intriguing story. I love it. Um, it's, for me, I find it very surreal. You know what I mean? There's, and, and that subtle comic, you know, comedy going on. And to my mind, as much as you wrote it for theater, I personally saw animation. That's just me. I saw a beautiful anime going on there. But if you would like to keep it, you know, as a theater version only, that's also good. But if you really would love to explore this, this could be a very beautiful anime, which then speaks to what um, Spongile was saying, you know, bringing this, uh, exploring the world between uh, the, 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 the myth of Basutu and the dragons and Libatwana, you know, there, there's a story there that could actually develop and it could be a beautiful anime, which then could also inform black children about, you know, their own myth. In, in, and, and obviously there's lack of content on that regard, on that platform. So you could also be considerate of exploring it to, on that platform of animation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, thank you everybody for writing. Thank you everybody for showing up and for being brave and for letting us be engaged with your work. Thank you everyone for coming and being here. But I'm gonna stop saying thank you because I've given somebody that duty. Thank you. <laughs> thank so I wanna you. stop saying thank you and uh, <laughs> go and, and let the person who has the duty do the duty. So let's duty this one person. I'm gonna, I'm learning this Zoom thing. So I'm gonna spotlight somebody. There we are. And then this is our thank you person. Malume Watsona, Malume. Yeah, I knew this was a bad idea. I knew that this was a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, so a great man once said that apparently there is no escape from completely transforming ourselves if we are to be adapted to the demands of our art. Mm. And that great man was Konstantin Stanislavski himself. Yep, and I must say, I dare say that he was right. <laughs> well, yeah, on behalf of, yeah, yeah, you can laugh, you can laugh, hey, Mr. Chadi, it's fine, you can laugh. <laughs> On behalf of you, on behalf of Works Reading Festival, I'd like to extend our warmest and sincerest thank yous to the TUT staff in the Department of Performing Arts. Thank you very much to Dr. Lemar. Thank you very much to Mr. Ndo uh, for, your, for your presence. And as well in the absence, we'd like to thank Professor Seda, uh, Me Moabi, Ms. Dane. We'd like to thank as well as Professor Lewis, McCarthy and Bright Innocent. They remain to be, uh, they remain being our, our role models. We learn so much from them. And I suppose in the end, what we're doing here is that we're creating better human beings. You know, we, we're developing ourselves to be better human beings. And in the end, I can tell you, and I think I speak for everyone when I say that we're walking out of TUT as better people, as better human beings, not only better performers, you know what I mean? So they have been there for us and doing the extra mile. Um, I'd like to also extend the very same gratitude to Mr. Charlie, Mr. Tawa, and Ms. Fisher. Yep, thank you very much. Oh, no, no, let's, let's clap hands, why not? Oh, guys, let's, don't be shy now. Don't be shy, let's do this thing. Yeah, who were also our, our panels. You guys were our panel as well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your fruitful feedback. And I'm telling you right now that I'm a very dramatic person, by the way. This is the bag, right? And this bag is growing. This bag is boop, gone. That is your knowledge. That is what you shared with us today. Thank you very much. Um, no good deed goes unnoticed. Thank you very much to the Writers Lab for the opportunity, for the platform, for us, you know, give us this platform for us to be able to tell these stories. Nasipi, a very, very special thank you to you two for organizing. You made this possible. This is beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can only imagine the, the, the hours that you put in preparing all of this for us. Thank you very much to the student writers. You guys have brought us into your worlds, into your imaginations. You gave your soul and you said, guys, this is my work. You shared it with everybody else. Thank you very much. As well to the directors who brought in their own fresh perspectives. 
Yeah, thank you very much for giving that second perspective to the work. And to the actors, you guys did a very, very awesome job. You guys had this leap of faith and you just took it, you jumped in blindfoldedly and you showed us your vulnerabilities. You showed us your strengths as well. Thank you very much for, for doing this. You know, it's, it was just amazing. I would also like to thank, um, well, not on the list. Thank you very much to Dr. Lepere. Thank you so much to you. Yeah, our commander in chief. Our commander in chief. Very modest for not putting yourself on the list, but I knew I yes. have to say it. I knew I have to say it. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Lepere. You made it possible, you made it happen. Can we please hold it like this forever and ever? Let this, let this thing be. It's in motion already. It's in motion already. It's in motion already. It's in motion. You know, it's in motion. It's going somewhere. It's going somewhere. It's going somewhere. Let's stop. Let's go. It's in motion already. Let's take it there, guys. Let it never stop. Let it grow. Let it be bigger. Mm. Some of us are doing third year. We'll be gone very soon. But let this be a new culture. A new yes, culture of, you know what? We don't give up. So we can't see one another in practicality, physically, but we can do something happen, right? And like I said we in did. the beginning, what we want to do is to become better human beings. So thank you very much, Dr. Libera. Thank you very much to everyone for attending and looking forward to seeing you guys very shortly. Please everyone be safe, do what has to be done, be better people. Thank you. Hey, Maluma Tona, I want to receive your letter. Receive your letter. No more. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming through, for showing up, for being here. Really appreciated. Um, so I, 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 we, when we thought about it in ACP and we went to Writers Lab, we were not imagining so many people will show up. We were already thinking that it was going to be very tight even in life, in life form. But thank you for showing up. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing with us and giving us feedback. If any of you, um, after you watch the videos and you watch all of the pieces, please, 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 we have got, we would like the feedback. Please email me. If you have access to any of the students, email them, send them, text them. Let's continue talking. So, um, and then the Writers Lab is open. We've got a book out called Hauntings. Uh, it's 200 Rand each copy. Yo, I have a piece in there, so buy it. <laughs> it's on there. It is the one. I will pin it, I will spotlight it for everybody. And then, um, uh, what else? Yes. And then we would like to do more of these. So if you've got a new play that you're working on, your, or even a screenplay or a radio play or a, or a thing, you know, or a, something, you've got something, you are looking for voices, you're looking for a director, uh, the Writers Lab, we are doing, wanting to do more of these things. So please um, make links, uh, call us and let us know. Um, and we're here, we're available. We want to do more, we want to uh, be with you. Thank you so much. And there is, how do we join the Writers Lab? We are working on that form. <laughs> but we are going to, we're going to launch a whole website. We've got this, we've got this, we've got this, we've got this, we're going to launch a whole website. We are busy, we are busy. So please, 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 please. Um, mm. As you leave, uh, we carry you very closely. We love you all. I can't wait to see each and every one of you, to touch you, to hug you. Um, and so looking forward to all of your amazing work. Let's continue writing. Let's continue doing and making. And as you go, take care of yourself and keep safe. And I will play a song as you leave. Shout out. <laughs> Thank I you, like Dr. It. Beyonce. <laughs> I am DJ. Thanks, Bye. Guys. Thank you, Thank you. Peace, 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 guys. Peace, yo, peace, yo, peace, yo. Keep writing, keep writing. <laughs> keep writing. <laughs> Shout out. Keep writing. Shout out. <laughs> Mem, recupera my piano. Uh, my piano is not going to happen. <laughs> no. Oh, oh no, I do have. Wait, wait. I might have. I might have. Piano. Wait, wait, wait. I do have. We need a solid exit. It's been a good wait. day. Okay, wait, wait, wait for that solid exit. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Si
Mango. Before you go to my piano. Yeah, go for volume. So we move the ha. Oh, volume. Volume. So we move the ha. A queen. Go volume. Let's go. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been really thank you so much for this. Yeah. Thank you. And you must, I love Zoe. She says, Ibendu, let's do Yabo. Yabo. Shout out. So, carry it and please. Yes. Yeah. So, bye bye. I'm a piano now. We'll play with my piano as we do. Ibuku. Yabo, thank you. Bye bye, guys. Come back. Peace, 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 y'all. Shab, shab. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a good day, man. Bye. Bye.